Well, he ran and he hid, but that porn director career finally caught up with Wes Craven. So Shocker tells the story of a serial killer who is caught and put to death by the electrical chair, but a deal with the devil allows him to come back as electricity itself. What is up everybody and welcome back to the Wes Craven review series, taking a short little break in my Batman rankings before my giant villain ranking this weekend to talk about another Wes Craven film and now we are at 1989's Shocker. Now this is another first time watch for me. I was actually sent this Blu-ray by a fan maybe about two years ago, never got around to watching it, so finally watched it for the first time this morning. And wow, <laughs> we got some things to talk about. So Shocker marked a point in Wes Craven's career where he was desperately seeking a production company that would allow him to have 100% creative freedom, carte blanche to make whatever movie he wanted to make. And right around this time was a company created called Alive Films, which was birthed out of Alice Cooper's manager. Yes, the rock and roll heavy metal manager created a movie production company. And out of this movie production company, a few lower budget horror films came out that have quite a bit of a reputation. John Carpenter actually made two of them. One of them was They Live. The other one was Prince of Darkness, which also gives you a little hidden context on why Alice Cooper was actually in Prince of Darkness. I don't know if that gives context to why he eventually played Freddy's dad, but you know, rock and metal, they all kind of, you know, they, they go back around to each other eventually. Nonetheless, Wes Craven was contacted by this company. They said, dude, you can make whatever movie you want to make, go for it. And he wanted to make Shocker. At this point in his career, Freddy was moving on to his fifth movie, The Dream Child. And Wes Craven, aside from writing an initial draft for Nightmare on Elm Street 3 that was then rewritten quite a bit for the third film, which became Dream Warriors, he had been trying to distance himself from Nightmare on Elm Street agonizingly to the point where every movie he tried to make almost seemed like they were forcing him to do things like add dream sequences or add some kind of nightmare sequences like he was a one trick pony like he could never do anything except for Nightmare on Elm Street and they just wanted more of that out of Wes Craven and so when he was given carte blanche he decided to do this story talking about a serial killer who eventually turns himself into electricity itself and is able to morph to different people. And there's also a bit of a psychic dream sequence, kind of a tether between the main character and the serial killer. So in 1989, about two or three months after Nightmare on Elm Street 5 Dream Child was released, in October we got Shocker which was supposed to be a new horror franchise. It was supposed to be the Freddy Killer. I think there was actual quotes from Wes Craven that he was going to out Freddy, Freddy, with this movie. Now, Wes Craven brings you his greatest creation. No more! Have you heard of Shocker before? Anybody? No? Okay, let's talk about why. So starting off with the pauses for Shocker, I think that Mitch Pileggi gives a really good, uh, dedicated performance as the main killer here of Horace Pinker. No more Mr. Nice Guy. And this is a character that, with this performance, with a name like that, with the concept here, there was absolutely potential for a new horror icon. And this is a guy that has gone on to do a few things that I've seen. I've, I've actually recognized him most from being the grandfather in Supernatural. And so when I saw him here, I was like, oh, hey, yeah, it's that guy. So he's kind of more of an underknown actor. He's one of those actors that's had a few roles here and there, but this is one that I think that he's most well known for in the horror community for certain. And it's because he really did give it his all. He, he has a lot of personality here. He certainly has the most personality of any character in this movie. What are you waiting for? Dickhead, you want to fry me, then do it, you fucking insect! You heard the man. And if Shocker succeeded on the level that they thought it was going to and actually did create a franchise, I think that Mitch Pileggi would have been one of those actors like Robert Anglin as Freddy Krueger to where they would have never wanted anybody but him to play that character. I also thought that the first 30, 40 minutes of this movie was actually pretty damn good. It sets up a lot of really interesting things. It plays it very serious. It's actually pretty intense. It's bloody. Mitch Pileggi is giving a very serious, like creepy performance as Horace. 
and it sets up a lot of things to later be explored in the movie that I was really intrigued to go on that ride for. And my final positive for Shocker is that the soundtrack is fucking awesome. This is a straight up heavy metal rock and roll soundtrack. You got Megadeth covering Alice Cooper. You got a super group in here doing the title song of Shocker where you got Paul Stanley and Tommy Lee from Motley Crue. Every time a song kicked on, I was like, fuck yeah, Wes Craven, hell yes. Much like the production company that birthed this movie, just heavy metal, rock and roll, horror, they go hand in hand. Anytime you see both of those on screen together, it charms the fuck out of me. Moving on to the mix, the main one for me is the lead performance by Peter Berg. Now, I really like Peter Berg, more so as a director. You know, he's never been the strongest actor in the world. This is the only time I've seen him actually lead a movie. He's usually a side character. He's a character actor that pops up once in a while, but he certainly is leaving his stamp on Hollywood as a filmmaker. He's done a lot of different movies. And so I like seeing him here. It was a surprise to see him in the lead role. It was a surprise to see him in a horror movie like this. And so there's part of that like that I have for the guy that made me enjoy his character, that made me latch onto his character, made me invest in his character and want him to persevere throughout this situation, want him to get one up over on uh, Horace Pinker. But at the same time, not the strongest actor, also not the strongest writing given to him for this character. Again, like the first 45 minutes of the movie, I thought he was doing pretty damn good because the script was actually pretty damn good. After that, when it gets a little bit sillier and he's supposed to lean into the camp a little bit more, I don't think Peter Berg is the strongest actor to be able to deliver camp. And now moving on to the negatives, and I've already kind of hinted at it twice, but after the first 45 minutes, this movie just took a nosedive for me. It was such a tonally inconsistent mess to where there was like this really dark, serious and borderline fucked up story going on for like the first half of the film and then it devolves into just cartoon camp it was so weird and it was so unexpected and the whole time I'm like why why are we doing this you, you, you set up everything for the first half of this movie in a certain way why are we changing mid movie it almost felt like the character of Horace went through the entire evolution of Freddy Krueger from the first Nightmare on Elm Street all the way to Freddy's Dead in one fucking movie. Movie starts off, he's dark, he's brutal, he's brooding, he's very menacing, he's evil, and then you get to a certain point in this movie that's just literally like one scene where it shows a dead body and it's like... And I remember seeing that and going, that's... A little goofy for the tone that we're in and then about 15 20 minutes later the movie just devolves into straight up goofy ass camp all the way to the point where the power glove sequence in freddy's dead yeah that's like the entire final act of this film where they go into the tv together and they're fighting throughout tv shows like leave it to beaver and old war movies and news outlets and weird shit and he's able to control them with the remote and the mix of the writing with the performance with the tonal shift with the goofy ass dated 1989 digital effects this thing just you would have to love it for how bad that it gets that's the only way you can truly enjoy this movie and unfortunately because the first half set up my expectations for what this movie was going to be and did not tell me at any point that i was in for a fucking looney tunes episode I could not get on board with the last half of the film. Come on! Give it to me! You got it, baby. Ah! I'm also really confused at Wes Craven and some of the decisions that he makes, not only in this movie, but it also maybe kind of reflect on his career. So the guy creates Freddy Krueger, one of the most iconic horror characters of all time. Nightmare on Elm Street, one of the most celebrated and one of the most revered horror films of all time. And it felt like, with the exception of his days doing Scream, he was always trying to escape that. He was always trying to get away from it, didn't have any interest in doing any more Freddy, didn't want to be tied to Freddy, always trying to do something better than Freddy. And then you do this, you get a movie where you're finally able to do whatever the hell you want, and what do you do? You just try to out Freddy Freddy. Why not just do Freddy? <laughs> Why the fuck didn't he just go back and do more Nightmare on Elm Street films? I know that there was some bad blood there between him and Robert Shea and there's some other, you know, politics shit going on, but I've never understood 
why he never went back to Freddy until New Nightmare. And this movie makes it even more confusing because it's like you have dream sequences here, you have nightmare sequences, you have elements of this character that's trying to be like Freddy Krueger. And it's just like, dude, your fucking, your boy is right there in the box office. Go back home. What are you doing? Or on the other side of that, if you have carte blanche, you can do whatever the fuck you want. Why are you trying to do this again? We've had dream sequences in every single horror film that this guy has made since the original Nightmare on Elm Street. Deadly Friend had one. Serpent and the Rainbow had multiple ones. Now you have this and it's just like, bro, dreams. You, you did it best once. We don't need to keep going back to that well. It's getting dry as fuck. So by the end of the movie, just I, I kind of felt myself frustrated as a fan to where I, you know, we'll never know the full truth. We'll never know, you know, what was on the hands of Wes Craven, what was on the hands of New Line and Robert Shea as far as the, where the fault lies for why Freddy went the direction that Freddy did for over a decade. But it just made me very confused about why Wes Craven spent a lot of his career trying to get away from his biggest success in my mind, his biggest success. And the movie also lost me a lot because there was just no rules. There was just no parameters. There was nothing established at any point in this movie to let me know what our boundaries were. What restrictions are we working within as far as these characters and the psychological and the, the sci-fi horror stuff going on? Like, where is our endpoints? What can we do? What can we not do? The movie just does, does everything. I mean, there's a psychic connection between Peter Berg and Mitch Pileggi that's never explained. It's just there that's how we find out he's the killer and we set up the events of the film which i was fine with at first because i figured they would give an explanation to it all they give is that oh yeah by the way he's mitch Pileggi's son he just never realized it okay i don't have a fucking psychic connection to my father i'm not like connecting with him right now while he's on the shitter you have the girlfriend that dies tragically in the first act of the film and it's kind of like the big catalyst for making peter berg have this vengeance against mitch Pileggi's character and then she comes back as a ghost at multiple points throughout the movie and can like physically interact with Peter Berg and gives him this necklace that for some reason is like kryptonite to Mitch Pileggi. I don't know if it's a symbol of love or whatever the fuck. And it's never explained. It's just He just holds up this little heart and he's like, oh, oh, no, put it, take it away. She even can come out on her own and like fight Mitch Pileggi with blue light beams and shit. And it's just so the point where I'm like, what the fuck? I don't know what we're working towards. I don't know what the struggle is. There's no tension here because it feels like the movie is just inventing shit as it goes along. So I don't know where we're heading because it seems we can go fucking anywhere by the end of this film. And we pretty much do. And my final negative, and this is not the movie's fault because when it came out, it was probably much more of a unique idea. But I have seen this serial killer possesses multiple people kind of concept multiple times before I've actually seen Shocker. And so, there's even a disconnect that I have, even if this movie took itself seriously all the way through to where I, I've seen this concept done better. I mean, the first thing that came to my mind was the Denzel Washington film Fallen, which is light years better than Shocker, where you have this very maniacal, big personality serial killer that has this thing out for Denzel Washington and he gets put through the, the gas chamber and then he becomes this little demonic presence that can go from person to person and keep murdering people. Kind of the same exact concept, but done much better. Played straight, done very well. And then I watch this and it's just this B-movie cartoon version of that story. And I'm like, no, sorry. I've already seen the best version of that story. You got nothing for me. So all in all guys, unfortunately, this one was a big miss for me. A lot of potential here. This could have been a franchise for Wes Craven. This could have been a horror icon, but they just went off the rails 45 minutes in. If they had stuck to the tone that they set up in the first act and a half of this film, I genuinely think this could have been one of Wes Craven's bigger hits, but because he just didn't know what the fuck movie he was making apparently or just was trying to make a bunch of different films it just turns into this hodgepodge of weird tones and weird ideas that it's no secret why this didn't connect with an audience and why this never turned into a franchise so if you're a fan of wes craven and you want to see him tackle another serial killer character definitely go in with very skewed expectations expect a lot of things to happen and to go in a bunch of different directions you may enjoy it for the b-movie camp but beyond that not a whole lot here. So unfortunately, gonna have to tell you to skip it.
So what do you guys think of Shocker? Are you somebody that saw this back in 89, you've loved it ever since? Are you somebody that watched it recently and thought it was this great movie we've never heard of before? Or do you not like this? And let me know your reasons down below if they differ from mine. Let me know your thoughts, guys. Please like and share this video. Hit that subscribe button if you're a fan of Wes Craven. We're going to be continuing going through the rest of his filmography. Up next is The People Under the Stairs. Really interesting one to talk about. That should be up early next week. Thank you guys for watching, as always. And remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean that you have to be.